So very happy to be here. Um, we got squeezed in last minute. Um, so maybe about us before I tell you what we will talk about for the next uh, 30 minutes. So in Vienna, at the Vienna University of Economics, earlier this year, we started the re uh, research lab uh, crypto economics research lab. It's interdisciplinary, um, and uh, we have 30 researchers. Wait, yeah, we have uh, 30 researchers from eight disciplines. So we have economists from uh, different types of economists. We have uh, um, information systems people. We have lawyers, uh, and we have people from the business administration side looking at crypto and applications from different perspectives. So we just started. And one of the greatest challenges is um, my vision on starting this uh, research lab at the Vienna University of Economics was because it's an economics university, and I fully agree with Anish, by the way, who said that crypto economics will be the next generation economics. Um, and um, the challenge that we're facing is that many to most, to almost all economists currently, they don't care, they don't see it. Uh, they're slowly waking up. It's a small, slow process. I'm very happy that Chris uh, came to work with us uh, earlier this month. And um, in this 30 minutes, we'll walk you through three parts. First, I would like to talk about token taxonomy because we haven't done that, and that's the very basics of modeling. What tokens are we talking about, right? Uh, in the second part, I would like to give a very simple, quick introduction to economics. Who here is an economist? Okay, well, we have some, so I assume most of you or some of you will be in our workshop. That's very good. Um, and. Um, and the th in, in our third part, Chris will actually lead up to what we will then deep dive into the workshop. Uh, what our approach for this ta token engineering uh, um, um, at our uh, research lab is. So what we want to do, we're at the very beginning. And what we will also do uh, in the workshop, we will take one model. OK. So uh, tokens are not a new thing. So I'm going to skip over this because uh, Anish already led up to this. We've always had tokens. We've o had tokens that represented value, um, casino tokens, uh, flight mice, li loyalty programs, uh, beads, masks as tokens of identification between tribes, etc. But also, and very important so, in computing uh, as access right management comp to manage computer operations, etc. So tokens in blockchain combine many of the aspects of tokens we've known in the real world. And token really is a very generic world, word that could represent anything. So before we start to want to model a token. Uh, what kind of token are we actually talking about? So when we get to token taxonomy, it gets messy because um, there is no general taxonomy yet. We have all these buzzwords flying around and nobody really knows what a utility token is or, well, we do, but they're very, we haven't, uh, we still don't have standardized uh, vocabulary to when we talk about tokens. And I think as long as we don't, um, it will be very hard to um, understand what we're talking about. So this is why we try to um, focus on four different perspectives. So when we look at tokens, in my opinion, uh, but happy to discuss this, we can say we can look at it from a technical perspective, from a rights perspective, from a fungibility perspective, and from a legal perspective. I'm sure there are many, many more perspectives out there, but I'd like to focus on these four. From a technical perspective, basically we have the protocol tokens and the application tokens. Thanks to Fabian and the standards, it has become very easy um, um, to create these tokens. Um, and uh, protocol tokens, we know what we're dealing with. There is some very sophisticated crypto economics behind the protocols that are already up and running. We know whether they work or not the moment we deploy these distributed networks that have some kind of protocol behind it. So um, if, uh, if there is some faulty design behind it, we will know quite fast. Now, with application tokens, it has become very easy to just, within, with a few lines of code, create your own token. That token can represent anything. and. Um, it can be, it represent a physical good, a digital good, uh, a right to perform an action within the network, and very often it's hybrid. Or it could steer on an application level a decentralized network, just as, uh, for example, the DAO token uh, was supposed to steer, um, more or less. Um, 
the actions in the DAO, which, yeah, then stopped. Anyhow, because maybe the design behind it was not so good. Now I'm having problems too. Oh. From the rights perspective, um, I'd la there are two ways to look at it, in my opinion. Passive tokens, active tokens. Passive tokens would represent some kind of store of value, some kind of real life value that could be a share, a security, some kind of asset backed token, or what we call currency from a legal point of view as a currency. So something that has value in our economy where I can buy things or trade to buy things. But a token could also be an activity token. And here, uh, the taxonomy gets a bit messy. Usage tokens, work, work tokens, usage tokens generally referring to uh, giving me a right to perform, to, to use network services, as for example with Bitcoin and Ether, et cetera. Um, or work tokens are right to perform some kind of action within this network. I'm not quite sure whether it makes sense to distinguish these types of activity tokens. Uh, what I think is very important to distinguish are reputation tokens, and we haven't seen the beginning of it. Uh, and uh, non-fungible tokens in, in particular are a very good way to create some kind of uh, reputation tokens. And if you want to know how not to design them, we should look at Steemit because the reputation token uh, sucks. Uh, it is not tied to your identity, ergo it is not really a representative value of uh, something that uh, maybe has an added value to the people in your network. You can buy more reputation with more money. So why? Because it was uh, created as a, um, uh, not, um, um, yeah, as a fungible token, right? Um, anyhow, most of these categories are hybrid. <laughs> um, most to tokens don't fall into one single category, but if we look at what type of token we have, it would make sense to deep dive into these aspects and understand what type of token we're trying to design. Now, I think this is very interesting because we've only seen the beginning of it, fungibility versus non-fungibility, and it all started out with fungible tokens, uh, the crypto community, um, you could trade, any unit is, uh, is worth the same. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you have more or less or mix the units with each other, they're indistinguishable, uh, only quantity matters. But NFTs are really what I think will make the token economy very interesting going forward, forward because it, it allows us to, to tie unique properties to that token. It really allows us to make programmable money, for example. It would allow us to, for example, have an expiry date on a token. For example, if you can earn, a reward token could expire after a while. That would create, if you, if you program that, and economists have studied that, this would uh, create more velocity, for example. Um, uh, or it could be tied to your identity, and then you could create reputation tokens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we cannot deep, deep dive into that, because that is not the purpose of this talk, but very important, want to understand what token are we talking about and what properties does your token have. So slides will be available. I can't go through this matrix, but identical, unique, transferable, non-transferable. There are many examples from the real life here. And I think tokens are easier understandable if we take real life examples and try to understand what that would, would mean in a tokenized environment. Um, don't have to un explain, I think, what uh, NFTs could be. This is, this is going to be the most interesting application, I think, like tokenizing real assets uh, and, and services and tokenizing completely new types of services online. Another matrix, active, pass passive, fixed, unlimited, transferable, non-transferable. Legal perspective, I'm not going to go into that either, but very important, we can uh, theoretically design anything we want, but what are the legal implementations or implications in the different jurisdictions um, that will limit our token design in a way. Okay, what we would like to focus on is what uh, also Trent said earlier this morning, Bitcoin and blockchain introduced this incentive machine. And we can really learn, um, it, we can design them in a way that it gets people to do stuff. But how do we design them? 
so it gets people to do stuff. And well, we're in the very early stages, as Anish said. Uh, the, the future is already here. We can see that with the amount of tokens that are already being, have been created and traded, but most of these tokens don't really have a good design behind of them. So we can use the power of incentive to redefine value creation. We come from a world of individual value creation, uh, some called it capitalism, uh, where private actors extract value from society, they internalize profits, they externalize uh, costs as much as they can wherever they're not regulated. Um, and Bitcoin showed us how we can kind of define collective value creation while incentivizing private actors. So Bitcoin showed us how we can incentivize a purpose of the network. Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer money without banks. And with a network token and collective value creation instead or equal to individual value creation of its net, net, network actors. And we could take these tokens and create any kind of purpose-driven token to incentivize CO2 emission reduction, uh, uh, proof of energy consumption, we have solar chain, electric coin, sun exchange, I don't know, walking coin, many, many startups out there, plastic bank, etc. proof of tree planted, recycling. But the question is, how do we design that? And, okay, now I'm having the problem. <laughs> I hope you learned quite a lot. Okay, I have to go back. Don't worry, uh, a lot of those slides are for later in the... Okay, so our assumption is that crypto economic networks, this is the world we live in today, and this is the world we're moving to thanks to Bitcoin and blockchain every, and, and everything that came afterwards, where we have... Uh, this is the world of private corporations or centralized nation states, and this is a world steered by a token, a distributed network of autonomous stakeholders that automatically run into the same direction. And what you can see, uh, but, and all steered by a token. And what we see here is that these networks resemble, and this is our assumption, they resemble nation states much more than companies. So we cannot use tools from business administration or engineering to de design them. Uh, but we need, uh, we need, uh, we need uh, tools from economics to design these networks. And this is our general assumption. Um, so, what is economics? Second part. We heard a little bit. Anish uh, gave us a small definition of it. Um, yes, there are different schools uh, with different uh, scientific layers and methods, very different perspectives, micro, macroeconomics, we'll tell you more about that. Uh, there are a lot of existing mathematical models that these schools use, um, and uh, we have, as a society, um, applied some of those models. So we have formulas and models that we could use. But very often people come to us and they say, oh, you're you have economists, please help us. We want to engineer this token. I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, do you know what that is? This is a matrix of all the economic schools out there. It's just half of it because it's, uh, that's the second part. It's, uh, yeah, Hochformat uh, in German. Um, so you can see everything from, you know, neoclassical, neoliberal, Keynesianism, institutional economics, Marxism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we have economists, but what kind of economic theory they're focused on and what methods they know, that's a whole different question. So when you approach economists or schools uh, or scientists or researchers, you need to know what kind of economist you need. It's just the same as uh, if you, most of you are techies, I would assume, and um, you know technology, but you don't know all technology. You don't know all the programming language. Uh, languages and you don't know everything that is related to a computer, you know some of it. And the same applies to economics. So economics is a bitch because uh, there are many different schools 
um, that very much have evolved from each other, that very often interrelate with each other, that sometimes might contradict each other, and uh, some are popular, others not. Some have been practically implemented, you know. Central banks have implemented some of economic policies that were recommended by some economic schools. Others have not been implemented, so they're theory, but we have no data. We don't know how well these tools that have been implemented applied, uh, especially through shocks, because we, have, we simply have no data. They might be good tools, but we don't know. What else? Yes. So everyone is a specialist in their own field. And um, because we're at the very beginning, uh, Chris started working with us. And I'd like to um, present, let him present the rest. Yeah, thank you. Oh. So from my formal education, I'm a mathematician. I finished my studies at the University of, um, um, of Technology in Vienna uh, with a strong focus on economics. But I'm not. Um, um, is, with regard to the schools from and described right now, um, I have a very mixed approach. So what we did there is we used different models and we tried to calculate them. So we tried to resemble society or resemble um, societal systems with economic models without limiting ourselves to one specific school of thought. Um, and I joined um, the Institute uh, of Crypto Economics in Vienna with one goal and I would like to work in two streams and I would like to combine the theoretical research with a practical implementation, which means that on the one hand, we will work backward looking, we will look um, at what is out there already, which models and which tools can we use to model ecosystems. And on the other hand, I would like to do something like today. So go out there and talk to people who are basically developing uh, the ecosystems uh, and uh, to look at their best practices. And I think that this is a very good approach in an iterative manner, as we already heard today, to combine these findings to basically ev evolve and to base our um, engineering framework on what we have already and what we can do out of it. Um, so. What we, we will be doing there is we will try to identify the similarities of crypto economics with economics. Um, we heard it already today that maybe it is the same, but we have to be sure. Um, we will formalize, this is very important Like for, my, for me as a mathematician, we, we need to formalize the network design and the network evaluation models. So we need to put out some equations out there. Um, uh, we, this will help us to identify the token functionality potential. So then we will be be sure or we will be aware of what what we are capable of, of achieving with, with, with a token. Uh, as Sherman already described, uh, we need like to know what we're talking about, so a taxonomy is necessary. And this will help us to design a bottom-up token engineering framework. And I like the previous speaker very much, who introduced um, the, the, the framework of how to, which questions basically to ask if you want to, to model agents behavior. So we, 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 will to base, we want to base our, our work on that. Um, this is what we will discuss in a workshop today. So uh, whether you like it or not, this is how the central bank in Europe sees you. So this here is a maximization problem of a representative household in the Eurozone. This is you. You are maximizing your utility, which you expect to have from consumption minus work. So you value consumption, you like consumption, but you dislike work. So obviously you have to hear some, some positive term and you have some negative term here. Uh, you are impatient, so you have some kind of time constraints as well. And you have, obviously, you have budget constraints, so you cannot spend more than you earn. Uh, and what you can choose as an individual or as, as a representative household is you can choose this, this here. You can choose how much you want to work, how much you want to consume, and how much you want to save. And this is basically here. So bonds is represent the savings, consumption, <laughs> And hours, and hours of work. And what I want to emphasize here is not in particular that this model fits for all ecosystems or whatever you want to build, but I want to emphasize on the components of this. 
And what I like very much about this is that we maximize choosing path of saving paths of, of uh, consumption of hours, uh, hours of work. So this means that you're not deciding right now at the very instant um, how much you are going to save today, but today you're deciding how much you're going today and for all times in the future. So you basically choose all your behavior from now on to infinity. And this helps you to, what this model also is, is capable of capturing is to capture intertemporal trade-offs, which means that you can trade utility you will have or you assume to have in the future with utility you might have today. So basically this is what we're going to discuss in the, in the workshop. But uh, in order to do that, uh, we, we need to ask ourselves exactly these questions. So um, how we, whatever we want to, to, to formalize, whatever you, we want to, to model, we, we want to know how to formalize the properties and the functionalities of a network. Uh, which general structure does it have? So who are the agents, the actors, or what, what, what actions take place in the, in the action space? Um, and in order to do that, uh, we started to, to, to define these questions. And we would be very happy if you could contribute. So whenever you think that, um, please have a look in the, into this document and, and try to contribute what, from your perspective, would be interesting to know. Um, now I want to break it down a little bit. I want to talk again from an ec economic general perspective on um, what we should include, basically. Uh, here we, we're talking about institutional economics. Uh, this means that the economy is not an ideal world. Uh, we have imperfections, we have irrationalities, we have information um, differences. What institutional economics focuses on is that we have transactions and these transactions have costs and we want to coordinate the behavior of the agents in order to reduce these costs. So one topic of economics or one sub-chapter of economics we want to look into is institutional economics, where you can look into the static perspective, like for now, or like the dynamic perspective, because conditions are changing um, in the course of time. And what also is very interesting is to look um, at the efficiency versus the vested interest perspective. So efficiency would mean if you like a good person, you would try to design an ecosystem which is very efficient and good for everyone. And if you have vested interests, you would maybe try to manipulate it. Uh, and uh, what happens in institutional economics is that firms and governments apply these rules to improve their respective performance. Um, what, what are microeconomics? Microeconomics are studies of particular markets and very fragmented segments of economy. So you have consumer behavior, you have individual labor markets, you have the th theory of firms. So you look at the demand, supply, you look at the equilibria, and you want to basically model or you want to investigate how these micro-level interactions take place. This is uh, a field that uh, most of you uh, might, might be familiar with, is game theory which of course models like the interactions on, on individual markets. Um, uh, Macroeconomy, however, is the study of, of aggregate, aggregates. So you have here the aggregate demand of all of the whole economy. You look at the national output, so basically the GDP of a nation, for example, and you look at the inflation. You have tools like the monetary and f fiscal policy of a government. Uh, you look at inflation, unemployment, economic growth, stuff like that. And uh, why I'm de describing this uh, is um, because um, yeah. macroeconomics is basically the whole ecosystem. But in order to understand the ecosystem, you might want to look at the agent's behavior on micro level first. So this is what we want to combine. We want to combine the micro perspective with the macro perspective. Um, what's very interesting here, uh, we had, uh, we, there, that's a quick walk through the evolution of macroeconomics. And you can see that first we had classical economics and then after the Great Depression, we learned that the, the tools um, were not sufficient. Um, to the modeling tools were not sufficient. Um, so uh, new economic schools came out of uh, the findings of uh, the Great Depression. And um, so economics really is a very new um, science. 
only 250 years old, and we don't have a lot of data. And, um, and we can see, and I think that's very interesting in parallel to what's happening in crypto, every time there is a shock in the market, economists learn how their models were not appropriate, and then they adjust. And this is very much what we also see when we, in crypto, the shock in the market is when it comes to a fork. You know, uh, when you have to adjust the model, when you have to adjust the governance rules, uh, and, um, and when the DAO fork happened, uh, the hard fork, uh, the Ethereum hard fork post DAO happened, I think what nobody expected is that all of a sudden we would have a second chain. When Ethereum Classic came, uh, first there was a second chain, nobody expected uh, for somebody to list those tokens, and then all of a sudden we had this black swan event that never happened before and wasn't accounted for, and uh, we had to adjust to that. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, what we are going to do next is, uh, this is not a solution. So, we are trying out. We are trying a first model today. And we are trying, um, uh, we will propose or we will discuss the DSGE model, which is like the model that is used by uh, the European Central Bank in order to model the European economy. Uh, which says that you have to specify dynamic optimal decision of individuals based on micro foundations. So you have to understand which problems do the individuals try to solve in order to understand what happens in the economy as in general. Um, and um, the components of this of this model are, and this might be might smell already a little bit like like crypto economics here. Uh, you, you have some representative actors, so you have participants in the economy. Uh, you have micro-founded, uh, of course, um, modeling. Uh, the actors are trying to maximize their lifetime utility, so they are forward-looking and try, okay, which which actions do benefit me most? How to behave? They have some intertemporal uh, trade-offs. So they try to, to choose uh, if they want to benefit now or maybe if they behave otherwise they might benefit in the future. Uh, and their decisions are based on future expectations. And the DSGE model um, uh, consists of three general actors which are households, firms and the government. And it looks like, uh, like this. I want to look at this. So you have the demand side of the model, so this would be basically the output, um, the, the consumption that happens here. You have the supply, this is what, what, what the production, what the firms, what the companies do. And then you have some governing monetary policy authority. And this also again looks familiar to people who want maybe to think about uh, crypto economics with the monetary policy and the money supply and everything that happens there. Uh, so how do they see the economy is like this? You have a household. And the people have to work in order to earn wages. Uh, this is like intermediate uh, firms, which, for example, uh, produce some intermediate goods. And then you have one final good producing firms, a firm that, that co co connects all these intermediate goods to one final good, which is then distributed to the household again, and the household has to pay for the, for the consumption. And then you have the monetary authority, which looks at this economy and try to steer the behavior uh, of the economy with, um, uh, with deciding which interest uh, rate to, to put in. This is the household optimization problem as a, comp as a component of this actor here, the agent actor A here solves for him basically this optimization problem, so how much work in order to be able to consume today, in the future, or whatever. And this influences, of course, the decisions of the other actors. Um, so what do we want to achieve in the workshop, or, or in general at our institute? We want to, uh, we want to, uh, to establish uh, connections to existing models. The best case would be we find a model that is fully applicable and then we can go home. But this is not going to happen. More realistic is we can use existing models, but we have to include adaptations, which means that we might have to change here something, or we have to subtract something else, or we have to add another optimization constraint. I don't know. Uh, so what we will be doing is uh, we will try the style of nation states. So basically how to look at the economy as a whole and how to model it, uh, this will maybe help us to understand the crypto ecosystems better. If we do that, uh, then we can see what works, what doesn't work, and we can maybe use existing formulas, equations, or solutions. Um, 
this is basically a slide descri describing why do we have similarities to crypto, which is um, basically everything that I said right now. We have actors, we have specific goals of these actors. They have to interact somehow. Uh, Their the interactions influence the global system. Uh, they are incentivized somehow. We have a monetary policy there. We have a communication of the monetary policy there. Um, we have expectations. And we have to evaluations of trade-offs between actions. Uh, so, on which levels do we seek similarities? This is very important to me to emphasize. Uh, we can look at the architecture layer of the whole system. We can say, okay, for example, um, the economy of the Eurozone looks exactly like, for example, the Ethereum network. This would be perfect. If you have some kind of supply and demand, um, what is the good? We have to identify this and then we can say, okay, maybe we have similarities here. Um, digging uh, down deeper, we could say we have, maybe we have the same interactions. Maybe we have in this economy of, of Ethereum, we have actors that are doing something that we already know. If so, maybe we can use the same equations we have already available for modeling these interactions. If this is the case, we might have already prepared solutions for that, because mathematically it's possible to solve this. We know this already. And if we have solutions, we already have some policy implications, and we know what will happen in the real world, or maybe what will happen in the, economy as, um, in the crypto economy. So, um, if we apply this to crypto, uh, we can basically ask these questions and this is what we will be doing in, in the workshop.